if Ford can release a car that they know has a failure rate. Why can't the nonprofit sector build programs that have failure rates in them? Yeah. Welcome back. Another edition of the Mission Driven Podcast. My name is Rich Brubaker, and today with my co-conspirator, Tom Stater, freshly arrived in Ho Chi Minh City from Bangkok. We are the Mission Driven Podcast, focused on inspiring, equipping, and helping entrepreneurs who are aspiring, scaling up, or stuck in the mud, get one step further towards their goal. Today, we're talking about an interesting article where UN Ops has invested a significant sum of money that has gone missing, how and why that happened, and then what it means for us and what we've seen in our own paths along the 20 years of our entrepreneurial journeys. So as a starting point, the New York Times put out a really interesting article about where the UN Ops got caught in what appears to be a scandal. We're not sure if that relates to one project or if there's multiples, but this particular project, about 30 million US dollars has gone lost. And that's Tom and I were discussing. It's a small number for the UN, but the way that it was lost is of real interest. And in this article, that which we'll link below, the details of it as you're reading through it are, are quite interesting. And as a starting point, you have UN ops involved and you have a family, a uh, father and daughter pair who are involved on the opposite side of this of this transaction. Transaction comes around, basically the UN itself was trying to find a new way to have an impact. They were investing into, or they were giving a loan to a for-profit organization to do their work, to do work that they would normally fund, you know, governments, nonprofits, multilaterals to do, just trying a new path. But the money has gone missing. So obviously the output wasn't exactly the plan. Now, the setup for this, if you read through the article, it was very interesting because there's a few key things I think that came out through this that kind of highlight the gaps of due diligence, you know, measure report verification, and then of accountability. And I think we'll talk about that, but just the basic facts started off at a dinner party. The head of UN Ops, she met this father who talked about this idea to get a celebrity to sing a song about oceans. Sounds great. There was no company built at the time or structured at the time. There was no past experience of where they could do this. But yet the, the number two at UN or the head of UN Ops, she believed the story, she believed in the program, and she decided to proceed with it. Needless to say, things didn't quite go off as planned. The song never came to fruition. And when they started to request the money back from the organization, the money would not be returned. And so that's kind of where we are. And I think for me, what was really interesting about this article just in general was not so much that the UN is caught in a, in a scandal or that the UN itself maybe lost the, you know, a few million bucks. It was the process itself of the UN and how they, one, developed the idea, the partnership they created, and where they ended up. But Tom, before we get into that, I want to hear a little bit about, like, what, what were your first impressions of this article? I mean, what I, what I took away from it is just another scandal within the nonprofit sector. This one's a bit, a bit, a bit different in that I think it would make a pretty good like made for TV movie or something. But I mean, to be completely honest, I think the most important thing was the UN said, we're going to investigate this. We're going to move on. And I think that I think that was the most important thing. In saying that, let me just point out that yeah. June 2024 is when they expect to release the report. So when you tell me that they're going to yeah. investigate it, the way that I kind of looked at it yeah. is like, they're going to kick it two years and they're going to release something yeah. at a point when everyone's already forgotten about it. In fact, yeah. I didn't really take that to be serious. It's a nice fact, but I just didn't think like, you know, 18 months of a project requires two years of investigation to figure out what happened. You know, at first I was like, oh, like I'm like a million dollars to sing a song or to record a song about the ocean. So like, I was like, or whatever the number is, it's, in the, it's a million. All right. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of money. And then I thought, well, how much does it cost to record a song? I have no idea. You know, I'm like, yeah, it could be, could be a hundred dollars, could be $10 million. I don't know. Right. And then I had dinner last night with a, someone who worked for a Southeast Asian uh, government in climate science, mm. specifically air quality. And I told her about this and she said, oh, that sounds like a really good idea to, you know, right. get a, a, like a, like a, uh, an influencer to raise awareness on climate. Yeah. Like that, that's a really good idea. Right. And I thought, well, all right, like. Maybe my initial gag reflex yeah. might have been wrong. Let's restructure this a yeah. little bit because yeah. there's two issues here I think that are really interesting. One is the UN's attempt to pivot into something innovative or try something new. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Totally. 
And then the second part okay. is the actual process that failed here because it was $31 yeah. million, not one. So yeah. let's just UN innovation. We've talked about the need to pivot. You read into that and like, that was a good thing. I thought it was great. I mean, I was like, oh, good on him. Like yeah. I'm expecting, but I expect a certain amount of failure within development work. Right. I just, I mean, like, and I, and I, and I rationalize it. If Ford and Toyota can release a car that they know has a failure rate, right. why can't the nonprofit sector build programs that, that have failure rates in them? Yeah, I would agree. Like I, I liked the general principle that they're going yeah. to move away from traditional actors to see if they can get a better outcome on the same problem. Yeah. You know, Love it. Fine. Let's Love try it. that. Let's throw some money at it. Let's see if it works. The problem though, is that they had a massive process failure, which I think mm -hmm. actually more systemically is yeah. that's where the problem actually is. And I think it should be mentioned that the number two, she quit her job. She's like, look, I own this. I'm out. And so that for me was like, okay, we have the right idea, but we need to be able to execute sure. on it, right? Like we need to try new things, but our old process isn't gonna work. I mean, you must recognize some of these patterns. What, what do you think is behind some of this? It seems like there was a due diligence issue flat out. I, I don't think anyone can disagree on that. Um, is it systemic? Maybe, maybe not. Right. Um, I, I can't say, but I can, I can say for this, maybe they shouldn't work with that guy again. I think that that's important. Like this is not uncommon in development work and in the for-profit sector where you invest in an organization or a company mm -hmm. and you lose money. Now right. this is really normal and accepted in the for-profit sector, right. in the nonprofit sector and the, and, the, and the development sector, it is yeah. not accepted. It has to be a zero sum you never are allowed to misuse funds or fail. Right, right. Now, you want to run by people, you know, and, yeah. and they just, I think it was bad judgment. And I think it was bad judgment on the company too. I think there's some dodgy stuff on that company. Like, oh, but I'm not yeah. a lawyer. So I can look at it and be like, yeah, you, you paid down your debt with this, well, with the UN money. And, and that's, that's bad. That, that's kind of actually more <laughs> core to my general concern and my general belief that there's, yeah. this isn't just a one-off. There's a systemic problem here because they didn't look at the business formation date. They didn't look at how much capitalization there was. They didn't look, they didn't ask for a $31 million budget. They didn't ask for any audited statements or financial, they didn't ask for anything. It was just check. But, but I, you know, I don't know if they didn't do their due diligence. They didn't, I, maybe their due diligence just wasn't up to snuff because I'm the same way. Like yeah. we have some, like our German donors, a lot of compliance. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right? right. A lot right. of, a lot of like, send us your, 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 your 990s, send us your, 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 yeah. your annual reports, send us the budget for the program, send, uh, we're going to do a, an NDA, we're going to do all that. Yeah. Then there's other, you know, donors that we have, they're a lot looser. Right. Um, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I would say that the higher the dollar amount for my little nonprofit, mm. the, the compliance is a lot higher. I think for the, for the UN, maybe $25 million is a speed or $31 million yeah. is a speed bump. Fair point. Maybe. Fair point. Um, you know, it, it might be the equivalent of $5,000 for me. I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, I just keep going back to like the compliance things that we have to go through and what corporations yeah. do in terms of like, cause we, we deal with a lot of corporations like you guys do and their compliance yeah. up front is always very structured. I think for my largest foundation, there's about 30 different forms that got to be signed off yeah. locally then at their Singapore headquarters, then sent back to the board and then put through the review. Like there's a lot of steps, right? But at the end of the year, I can send a three page word document that just says what we did this year. And as long as the number is right, they don't ask any more questions. Oh, so, yep. you know, and this is something I've seen on a regular basis in terms of like just the general approach to accountability and verification. There's a lot more forgiveness. If this is a pure commercial, arrangement, there would 
be more checks in place because it'd be much more valued in a way. But I think like this, this culture of where we're giving you money because we're doing good can mean, okay, upfront, we want to make sure you're the right partner. And whether or not that due diligence is enough, I guess that's debatable, right? For this, for this particular case. But then second from there is like, at the end of this, like, what did you do? What was your process? Where were your gaps? And from there, how are you going to fix it? In relation to this project, the one thing that I kept coming back to is, you know, most of my corporate donors on the on the, on the on the nonprofit side, and even some of the commercial side, if your size of contract constitutes a significant, let's say 50% or more of your overall budget, they actually, sure. they are starting to walk away from those relationships because they don't want to create this, this codependency where after two, three, five years, you can't get off of them. And so that for me was what I was reading, like these contracts going through and how they developed this relationship, like that never would have happened in a lot of market oriented foundations. And so maybe that's because it's a small amount for the UN. It's, a, it's an innovative approach. They're trying something new and they, they hatch this over dinner. I don't know. But I thought it was like, that was another bell that went off in my head. You know, we deal with a certain amount of due diligence mm. um, that probably a UN contractor or a UN donor right. is not going to get. And I also think that the UN isn't a dot. I, you know, I think that it's, it's, well, I know it's made up of many different agencies mm. and they're made up of people. Right. And, and each individual um that runs these departments you know they they bring you know a little bit of themselves into it right. so you know and i so this guy it seems like uh be a little bit more of a i would if i dare say like more of an elon musk you know kind of a guy who wants to shake things up do something different you know and he, he probably thought hey let's let's do something a little bit more innovative well there's risk in that I think you're a very generous person, Tom. I, I have a different read. I think on the UN side, the the director who left, I think it's a very human. I, I I give her credit for taking the bullet, resigning and publicly saying she's not sure the details, but it was her responsibility to know the details. The counterparty, I look at the fact the father set up, I think it was three different shell organizations or three entities where this money was coming in. And he was using that money to pay off the loans from something else that we don't know enough about. And so for me, there's kind of two aspects of that. One is- I think, I, I, I think they were just running a, a deficit for a couple of years yeah, which, um, and, and, and they just had some debt. But, but again- I, like, I don't think they went into, into, into details on that. They didn't, yeah, they didn't go into details. I would say that that's where the UN due diligence should have really bid on that. Like, wait, wait a second, right? Like- There you go. Right. But then the second thing yeah. that I come back to is, okay, let's assume that he is this crazy Elon Musk entrepreneur. He was just doing what he had to, to pay bills, to stay alive in hopes that he could sell another contract. Oh, no, no. Else. I was, I was making in reference to the, the, the director of, uh, oh, okay. Okay. Of, of That's the separate. UN agency. Yeah. You know, he was just trying to do something different. Yeah. Like, you know, let's, 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 you know, invest in. And that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Profit company. Which that. Sure. Which is a shame in, in that sense then, because if that if that person really was the leading innovator and really trying to push that, got undermined by a system that allowed for this failure to happen. And then that put the whole project at risk. And I think that is, as a founder, um, something that you have to really balance pretty carefully. I think we've talked, we've brushed on this in the past, like how do you assess risk and how far do you go? And I think, you know, not saying that what we read in the UN would ever apply to us because we're generally upstanding individuals with our organizations. But as you take risk and as you develop new relationships, you know, I think reading through this, I took away a lot of, thank God I have good process away from that saying like, look, sure. I, I don't have to worry about this specific thing. But at the same time, that's because I learned the lessons early on of having, you know, a solid brand and wanting to always be the trusted partner, even if at the expense of, say, the potential impact I could have. Like, I'm definitely dialing it back because I don't want to overextend my skis. You know, I, I want to talk about one thing on this that I yeah. found to be kind of, they didn't understand how, how, how fundraising occurs, mm. you know, in general. Like the, and what I mean by is the New York Times 
didn't understand yeah. how fundraising occurs for a lot of nonprofits. Right. Like right. they're like, and they met in a dinner party. Like, yeah. <sighs> like the majority yeah. of our donors at the library project, we met over dinner, yeah. coffees, lunches. I, I thought, yeah, all right. So they met this guy at a dinner party. Like, okay. There's, like, there's a couple things I took. Cool. There was a couple things I really <laughs> I found interesting about that. One was how hard the New York Times tried to sell that moment as like something scandalous. But the second thing I was it's, also thinking, like, wow, they had a specific dinner party to meet potential candidates for this specific yeah. project. And yeah, okay. You could argue how That's much. That's a great idea. It's a great idea. I guess the only thing related to the NY to the NY New York Times comment was like, did they spend too much money for it? But again, like that's kind of the job of the people there to determine, right? But I was still like, wow. Who cares if they spent too much money if they if they accomplish their mandate yeah. and their mission and their programming? I how much they spend on fundraising kind of doesn't bother me that much mm. one because it's the un and they spend a little high much higher than yeah than than private small nonprofits. Sure. um but you know i mean if they're but honestly if their a, hearts in the right place yeah. and they're and they get the job done i don't really care well it's just the problem is they didn't get the job done yeah i mean that's totally like, the problem but actually when when you said that i'm thinking like jesus man I, i've really got this filter on people in a way that's like they shouldn't do that. But I'm thinking like, you know, if you're a venture capitalist, you take people ax throwing and hunting and long benders at, you know, over gorgeous dinners. It's like everyone spends money to make money. And the UN in a way just did the same thing. They held a dinner party with who they, at least according to this article, who they believed might be good partners, hoping to be introduced to the right one. They found the one that they- They, they had a dinner with deep pockets. Mm. And that is what any- nonprofit organization does in the world any large one at scale yeah. they invite deep pockets in the room now those might be individuals family foundations companies whatever yeah. and we try to get them to fund our programming yeah now this was a little backwards they were looking to give money right so right. they were the deep pocket but do you think <laughs> and they were they were looking for for funders yeah. which is really interesting you know, that's, but in a flipped. way, in a way that set them up for the sucker punch, right? Like, <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I'm not, on, I'm not on that side of the, yeah. of the funding race, you know, like I imagine that uh, honestly, what I've learned more than anything is it's really hard to find quality donors. Yeah. I've heard over and over again from our donors, corporate foundation whatever yeah anyone at, that, that donates at scale professionally yeah they say hard. you know how hard it is to find quality donors we're really happy we met you yeah and i think i understand a little bit better now mm -hmm. it is hard it, it is. really is it is because so many organizations are very small and i find like you go from the very small there's a couple medium size then there's the large right and i find to get to medium that's the actual hardest part of that scale. Like once you get through the medium and you're at large, you can stay there for quite a while without, as long as you don't screw up massively, but it's getting out of that you know, nascent I, stage. I, I mean, my feeling is, and this is kind of how I look at it. Like, so I read the article mm -hmm. and, and, and I had this, I have my individual opinions. All yeah. right. Like I have like, you know, they shouldn't have done that. And I'm not really sure if a song was the right idea. And da, 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 da. you know, I have these opinions, but, but at the end of the day, when I, when I finished it, and I got to the bottom. I think it's really important to just say, okay, I'm going to get back to work. This is nothing. This, this doesn't represent the not-for-profit sector. It doesn't represent the government organization uh, sector. It doesn't represent development. It does represent a problem that exists in nonprofits, though, and I don't think is, okay. is being addressed fast enough. However, that being said, I'm also of the belief that we do need to move faster and break more shit. We hold ourselves back because the appearances of potential impropriety or potential failure, I should say potential failure, hold us back from success. 
and from taking big audacious kind of steps that everyone else is allowed to from venture capital to healthcare to coal mining to guns it doesn't matter like they can fail we can't and i think like that's the part that is ubiquitous across a lot of nonprofits it's that culture of fearing failure and because of that i do think that what this article does one i think it highlights a big failure big for our size it shows that there's still accountability when that happens which is great i think it also calls out the fact we need more of this to happen like i remember when a, a friend of mine for-profit social enterprise was given a five hundred thousand dollar loan now after three years the loan was going to convert to equity um, if they didn't pay it back and my friend i was i was friends with both the don't the, the the investment fund and the organization about two and a half years in the the investor was like you know dude won't even take our phone calls anymore he's not gonna pay us what should i do i'm like sue him take his money put him out of business and this is a good friend of mine he's like wow how could you say it? like because we need more accountability in this space because what i find is there is that lens of fear about these issues but at the same time there's also a what are they going to do? Sue me. And I think we need a little bit more of that. And so that's where I think like, it, it doesn't represent all NGOs, of course not, but it represents something that I believe to be holding a lot of NGOs, if not the majority back, which is there's been some failures that we never address, we never talk about, and we never hold anyone accountable until something like this happens. And for me, that's the bigger lesson. Like, it is the small organizations that need to be built like us, upstanding, doing the best work and being very transparent. And when we have failures, which we talk about publicly here for full transparency's sake, that we encourage that, I think, more um, than, than we have in the past. Yeah, but also like, you know, I think it's important for, for people to understand that if you're going to be, the longer you are running an organization, the greater chance you are going to have a financial sure. um, pickup. You're going to fuck up at some point. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Like it's going to happen. Right. And I think the single most important thing that you need to have is some, and to recognize it beforehand and create a culture within your organization where when it happens, mm -hmm. People are not afraid to step forward and say, this just happened. This is the solution. Let's do a quick investigation on this. Yeah. And it's done in such a way that no one gets fired yeah. unless there's like theft. All right. right because, right. you know, you're, there's accountability. Theft is one thing. But, but then there's just, you know, if you're just, if you just made it, if your team made a mistake, and you can eat the cost yeah. because you've got some retained earnings every year, which you should, yeah. um, you know, that's why you have retained earnings, yeah. you know, to, and, 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 and you, and you build better processes from that. Yep. That is what you want. Right. It's not to demonize. Like the thing that worries me about this is that it puts it, it, it puts the false, it, it show it, it what it's saying is that someone's head has to roll yeah. every time a financial failure occurs mm. in the development sector. And I just don't believe that. But if someone, but, if someone had the right intention, it just went pear shaped. And it just went pear shaped. Yeah. Like, you know, there's Try nothing wrong with saying, all right, well, how can, how can we learn from this? How can yeah. we grow from it? How can we, how can we, we really like this idea of supporting for-profit companies. Yeah. How do we do this better? How do we do this better? We end it with a list of threes, as always, Tom. Love that transition. I don't know what you're going to ask me this time. This <laughs> is We right. really rambled Just on this one. So. <laughs> three, three takeaways from this that you would say someone looking at this should pay attention to or should learn from. I'm going to say that, A, the first thing that you need to recognize when reading these things is, you know, these things happen. They just do. Um, and I think it's important to look at the perspective, look at the, the total budget that the UN has and what is, what is $31 million represent of that, of that total. Yeah. Right. I, think, I think the first takeaway for me is 
now is a really great time to come forward with innovative ideas, but you need to be right. able to back them up with the experience, with the organization, and, and show that you have the capacity. Like if you, if you have that ability, you have that idea, it's very clear the market is looking for this. The second thing is I think that you have to own your failures publicly now. Um, and that might actually help build credibility if you're an entrepreneur trying to talk about what the potential of your organization is to solve a problem that the other side of the table is facing. Like, look, we've done all these things. We have this many years of experience. We went through this project. It didn't quite work, but that lesson led us to this. And so give it a shot. And then I think the third one is, yeah, just don't be afraid to fail or to always be in a position where you feel like you need to apologize for that failure. I mean, you need to own it, obviously. But I think the, the mentality around nonprofits of over apologetically, you know, profusely apologizing whenever there's a failure or using it as a, as a reason to not grow is something that I worry about. And that's separate from all the little things that happened in this article. I mean, there's clearly a problem with the UN. They clearly got this one wrong. But again, like you said, like, okay, move on. What does it mean for me? And I think at the end of the day, the more accountable you are, the more brand leverage you're going to have to then get more interesting things done to be able to not just convince people, but to really verify that you are the right partner. And if you can do that, if you learn those lessons around, have big ideas, you show you take risks, you show you, you learn from your failures, you're honest about your failures, and then you find the right dinner parties, you might find that you get into the right spots with your next program. And for me, I think th that's the takeaways for me. So with that, yeah. Tom, thank you very much. Another interesting, exciting, inspirational, engaging, equipping organization conversation there.